Welcome to Hearing Histories, a special edition of Reading from the Archives in which we will be using sound archives to explore the past and narrate it in the words of those who experienced it firsthand. We will listen to extracts from archived sound recordings that have been preserved at Norfolk Record Office through the Audio Preservation Project Unlocking Our Sound Heritage. Chaired by the British Library in London and made possible with thanks to the National Lottery Heritage Fund, Unlocking Our Sound Heritage is working to preserve rare and at-risk sound recordings by making digital copies, ensuring that the audio is safeguarded for future generations and can be made publicly accessible today. December has arrived, and so begins the time for decking the halls for Christmas. But what are the origins of our annual festive decorations that are commonplace in our homes today? And how did everyday people decorate for Christmas at the turn of the 20th century in Norfolk? The Christmas centrepiece for many homes is the Christmas tree. But when did it become traditional to display an evergreen tree inside the home as a mark of festivity? The tradition has many origins and is rooted in traditional religious practices across the Northern Hemisphere. Long before Christianity, Evergreen plants were used to decorate homes, particularly doors, to celebrate the winter solstice on December the 21st or 22nd, when the day is the shortest and the night the longest. The evergreen plants represented the return in strength of the sun god, who had been weakened during the winter. The plants symbolised the idea that the summer was expected to be returned, and that the sun god would glow once again. Celts decorated their Druid temples with evergreen boughs to symbolise everlasting life, while Vikings saw evergreens as symbols of peace and light. During medieval times, fir trees were used to celebrate religious feasts such as that of Adam and Eve on December the 24th. Named paradise trees, they were decorated with apples. The Christmas tree that we are familiar with today is derived from traditions originating in Germany. Legend has it that in the 16th century, a German Protestant reformer named Martin Luther was walking home through woodland near Christmas time. He was captivated by the beauty of the starlight shining through the fir trees around him, so much so that he decided to recreate it for his family by bringing a cut fir tree into his home and adorning it with a small candle. It is recorded that in 1605, a resident of Strasbourg documented witnessing inhabitants setting up fir trees in their parlours and hang thereon roses cut out of many coloured paper, apples, wafers, gold foil and sweets. The Christmas tree made its way to the UK via the royal family when the bough of a yew tree was displayed at a Christmas celebration held by German-born Queen Charlotte in 1800. Dr John Watkins, one of Queen Charlotte's biographers, who attended the party, recorded a vivid description of this captivating tree, from the branches of which hung bunches of sweet meats, almonds and raisins in paper, fruits and toys most tastefully arranged, the whole illuminated by small wax candles. He adds that after the company had walked around and admired the tree, each child obtained a small portion of the sweets it bore, together with a toy, and they all returned home quite delighted. The tradition became popular among the masses when in 1846 an illustration of the popular monarch Queen Victoria and her German husband Albert appeared in the Illustrated London News. The image captured the pair and their children standing around a decorated Christmas tree at Windsor Castle. We will now move forward to the turn of the 20th century and use sound archives to hear extracts from oral history interviews to discover how Norfolk people decorated for Christmas. Reginald Harvey was an agricultural worker born in 1903. As a child, he attended Gimmingham School. He describes his memories of decorations used by the school and his childhood community during the holiday season. Can you remember Christmases at school and in your home 
And how you celebrated? Yes, they had a Christmas tree at school. The tree and course had Christmas trees at home. But people couldn't afford to buy a Christmas tree. They sometimes cut. But of course, there was high hedges then, with holly bushes and all sorts growing. They'd often cut a holly bush. You see, and they'd have to have that for a Christmas tree. The children would do just a few things hung on. Richard Reed, a fisherman from Great Yarmouth, was born in 1906. In this extract from an interview which he partook in, he describes one of the types of popular Christmas decorations that he remembered from his childhood. At the time, a popular children's game was hoop rolling, where a wooden or metal hoop would be rolled along the ground, guided and propelled by a stick held by the player. Mr. Reed explains how at Christmas time, these wooden hoops would be repurposed to create Christmas window decorations. Would you decorate the house? He said, who put a hoop in the window? No, two hoops, two wooden hoops. Mm -hmm. Two wooden hoops, because the kids used to play with hoops years ago, you know? Yeah, yeah. Because you, you could in those days, there was no traffic, there was, no, there was, there was only horse traffic, mm -hmm. and that wasn't very, very thick. And the kids used to play with hoops in the roads, iron hoops and wooden hoops. Well, you'd have two wooden hoops, but they cost about 18 each. They'd be about 18 inches mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in, in uh, diameter. And uh, you put one inside the other, and they used to cut, cut it round with, with cotton wool. Oh, yeah. Hang them in the window and put one or two toys on it, uh, and that was all. Some of them did that and some of them didn't even bother about that. Today we are used to adorning our Christmas trees with baubles, but where did this tradition originate? Christmas tree baubles derive from the German Alpine town of Lauschke, where, in the late 1840s, businessman and founder of the Lauschke glassworks, Hans Grainer, began to produce hand-blown glass ornaments in the shapes of fruits and nuts, decorated with silver embellishments made from lead or mercury. By the 1870s, Lauschke was exporting Christmas ornaments to Britain. In this next clip, we hear from Mr and Mrs Bartwright, a couple from Great Yarmouth, who were born in the 1890s, and reflect upon the glass ornaments, which they describe as toys, that adorned their Christmas trees. But we always had marvellous Christmas trees. Did you? Oh, the lovely toys. Yeah. Oh, they were toys then. Oh, they, you'd get a big oh. box of toys then for about tuppence, you know. Like oh, you God, they were. Put a toys in for tuppence. What, the toys you got as a child? For the trees. For the Christ hang on the Christmas mm. tree. The glass toys. Oh, yes, they oh, baubles. gorgeous. Yeah. We always had a beautiful tree. We now move on to gifts and the contents of the Christmas stockings of Norfolk residents at the turn of the 20th century. But before we hear first-hand accounts from the sound archives, we will look at the origins of the Christmas stocking itself and some of the traditional gifts found inside. The tradition of leaving gifts in stockings derives from St Nicholas. Today we think of St Nicholas as jolly old St Nick in association with the modern image of Santa Claus. But the saint himself was in fact a popular religious figure long before becoming a cultural phenomenon. Saint Nicholas was born in the third century in Petara in Asia Minor, a large peninsula also known as Antolia, which constitutes the major part of modern day Turkey. Known as the protector of children and sailors, his association with gift giving derives from the story of a poor man and his three daughters. At the time, a young woman's father had to offer prospective husbands something of value, a dowry. The larger the dowry, the better the chance that a young woman would find a good husband. Without a dowry, a woman was unlikely to marry. The poor man in the story of St Nicholas was unable to provide dowries for his children without which the daughters were destined to be sold into slavery. It is said that on three separate occasions, a bag of gold was tossed through the open window of their home and landed in stockings or shoes that were drying by the fire. These were said to have been from St Nicholas and led to the custom of children hanging stockings or putting out shoes to be filled with gifts by St Nicholas. 
Emily Lacey was born in 1880 and lived in Great Yarmouth. In this extract from an interview, she describes leaving out boots into which Christmas presents were left and describes some of the gifts she remembers receiving as a child. We had a Christmas. We used to put our boots, shoes, mm. round the fireplace. Stockings, we used to call it, hang on. When, at first, that used to be our boots. We used to stand up our boots in the fireplace. We'd go down in the morning. We used to get a little box of beads. All coloured beads. Oh, we thought the world was that. They were either penny or tuppence. But tuppence, I think, them days. I believe I had my mother say they were tuppence. All in little tiny. I bet there were no other women. We used to thread them. Oh, we thought we. Mm. The word of it. And uh, Christmas stocking. They used to have little. Christmas stockings and in these Christmas stockings used to be uh, um, sweet mice. Oh yes, I know mice sugar or mice. Yeah. Sugar mice and paper, perhaps a little paper book. Oh yeah. Little tiny paper book and that. Oh we thought we'd done well. <laughs> and then when we got older we'd put the stockings up. Then I can remember the one having a pinnacle, mm -hmm. little child's pinnacle, pair of socks, because we wore socks mm -hmm. then. And I think I had a pair of gloves. I think one of my sisters or someone made me a pair of gloves. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. Well away. Mm -hmm. What we had pounds worth. <laughs> In some variations of the tale of St Nicholas, St Nicholas gifted the three daughters of the poor man with gold balls rather than sacks of gold, which is said to have inspired the tradition of gifting oranges. The next few speakers that we'll hear from from the archive all recount their memories of receiving oranges, as well as apples and nuts within their stockings. For many, Oranges and other exotic foodstuffs would have been rare commodities and receiving an orange would have been an exciting treat. This was again the case during the First and the Second World Wars because of rationing. All of those down a stock and up in our Christmas Eve, mm -hmm. the foot of the bed like it had, and the tell used to be in a you know, little game, mm -hmm. that was eight and then about one orange. That you were a boy, perhaps it'd be half a dozen marbles and that, and if you were a girl, you'd be string of beads. Little beads and that, and different things. One so orange, two nuts. One orange, yes. Lot, the lot, a couple of sugar mice. Can't remember about the You were made for life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, how did St. Nicholas develop into the Father Christmas that children know and love today? As a religious figure, St Nicholas's popularity was widespread, and his feast day, celebrated on the anniversary of his death, December 6th, was said to be a lucky day to marry or to make large purchases. In the 18th century, New York newspapers reported Dutch families gathering to honour this anniversary. The name Santa Claus itself derives from the Dutch nickname for St Nicholas, Sinterklaas, a shortened version of St Nicholas, Dutch for St Nicholas. In 1804, John Pintard, a member of the New York Historical Society, distributed woodcuts of Santa Claus at the Society's annual meeting. These depicted images of St Nicholas filling stockings hung over a fireplace with gifts. In 1809, American short story writer Washington Irving further popularised St. Nicholas in America by referring to him as the patron saint of New York in his book, The History of New York. Santa Claus was depicted in a reindeer pulled sleigh in 1821 in a children's Christmas booklet, and in 1822 this was made iconic by the Episcopal minister Clement Clark Moore, who wrote a poem for his daughters entitled An Account of a Visit from St. Nicholas. 
more commonly known as Twas the Night Before Christmas. We will now hear other accounts of childhood Christmas toys, beginning with the memories of Beatrice Mary Reynolds from Lowestoft, who was born in 1898, and then Mr Harvey, who was born in Norfolk in 1903. And what sort of presents would you get for Christmas? Well, I used to get skip and rope with bells on, you know, and it, when Diabolos came in, mm. you know, like this and catching on the string. I loved the Diabolos. And I didn't like dolls very much. I had a big teddy bear. I've still got two teddy bears, mm -hmm. though. Did you hang up a stocking? Oh, yes. I was hung a stocking up for uh, Christmas. That's what we often say. All you got in there was an orange and two or three nuts. And that was about your life. I remember my aunt Nellie, my father's a sister, she lived in London and she sent me a real football, you know, a leather blown up ball. And I remember waking up that Christmas morning and smelling new leather. And I hung down this box and got this out. That was the most marvellous thing I ever had in my life. And I, and I love the smell of new leather to this day. That's true. That was remarkable, I had this big ball. But of course, we took it out and there's all hedges everywhere, so every time we played with it, away the hedge had got punctures. And it wasn't long before I had to stop it full of horse hair, and then we had a ball that lasted a long time. One of the main focuses of Christmas celebrations are Christmas dinners, and we all hear accounts of festive meals, beginning with Howard Cook, who was born in 1897, and references how the main meal at Christmas time during his childhood would be supplemented with produce gifted by employers. Well, Christmas time, of course, out in the villages, you never saw an apple, I mean an orange or any nuts or any Christmas fare until about the week before Christmas. Mm -hmm. and to be quite honest, money wouldn't buy very much of them. And so sometimes you had an orange, sometimes you had a nut or two, but uh, that was about all. And uh, as regards to the Christmas dinner, well, it was customary, you see, then for the farmer to give each employer, employee either a lump of beef or a couple of rabbits for their Christmas box. So we used to have that, you see. Otherwise, there were some people had chickens, you see, and would kill a chicken. But we used to knock up a Christmas dinner of some sort, you see, like that. <laughs> kippers and taters for our Sunday dinner. Oh, you love a kipper. We had bacon and carrots and taters for our Christmas dinner. <laughs> We're still alive. Yeah. Well, we used to, but you know, we all just we all had a chicken in here or a taggy. Never had, I never remember Christmas without one. And of course, that we used to think something like that, you know. Yes. And we'd all be round the table and that used to be allocated out to the mother, she used to cut more lit for us, and, and then of course when the girls got old, of course they'd done it. We will end on memories of Christmas celebrations, from parties to traditional carols, games to sing songs. Oh, I used to have a Christmas party. I wish I had a Christmas party. I was allowed to invite 11, 12 with me. I used to go to quite a lot of Christmas parties. In fact, one Christmas I went to so many, I think I was sick at the end. <laughs> you know, they all had Christmas parties then, children did. I, I don't know if they still have them, do they? I think I, I, I haven't felt your, your parents. What, what did they, they do at Christmas time? Did you have any... Oh, we had a lot of parties. We had a big party. We used to have a big party. I always had a children's party, but that was separate. But uh, Christmas time, we called Aunt Pleasant and Uncle Jimmy. They were no relation. They were my mother's friends. They used to have a party in Park Road. We used to go there one day, and then my mother had a party. And then we'd go to my mother's friends, sometimes Mrs Fisk in Park Road. She'd have a party after Christmas. And oh, we had quite a lot of parties. That was a lovely Christmas. I remember that one particularly. We had a sing-song on Christmas Day, if Christmas evening, round the piano, and we had a rare time with the cake and the sweets and the little food presents we got. And I remember I must have eaten too much so I felt a bit iffy afterwards, but I wasn't sick, but I did feel a bit queasy. Of course we all went to church Christmas morning. Well, of course we like going to church because they use Christmas hymns, you see, and might have read some Christmas cards and hymns at school. And then you went to church and some of the Christmas hymns, that was 
Well, it was a lot of snows on Christmas. Everything was snows on Christmas. So we had some very little, that was a beautiful time. Did you used to hear carols singing? Well, I was getting a lot older when I went to carols. But as children, we did very little. In fact, in the village, you scarcely heard any. Some villages, they had bell rings at Northrop, they had. You know, the hand bells. Oh, and they were lovely things. I had a number who had the two bells, and they used to go with these hand bells, you know, playing carols. That's a lovely sound in the night.